For a number of years, there have been a lot of debating going on in the field of statistics. And sometimes it's gotten really entertaining and sometimes it's been uh, almost arm wrestling. But we now have a situation where the American Statistical Association has released a statement on statistical significance and p-values. And to talk about this, I'm with Executive Director Ron Wasserstein. This really has been a battle royal for some time, hasn't it? Well, it's certainly been a controversy for decades. And there's been plenty of things written about it. So it sort of makes one wonder why the American Statistical Association would decide now to put a statement out. And the fact of the matter is that even though lots had been written about it, nothing much was being done. And we thought perhaps if a statement came from the world's largest community of statisticians that maybe the game would change a little bit. So this isn't really an in-house document where statisticians can now look at this and figure out different things and, and can kind of take the, the argument from here. This is really a shot across the bow to all scientists saying the ASA has now come together. We, ha we have kind of agreed on this consensus. Now, everybody, we should get, to get together and just chat about this. So that's right. We really are looking to have a conversation, like a conversation that you and I are having with lots of people about how to take what we know about what uh, is good with using p-values and what is not, and more effectively passing that along to scientists um, everywhere so that we can do a better job of making inferences using statistics. Now, you have like, I think, six points that you're trying to get across here. And of course, the one that many of the investigators who read Jack and who are subscribers to CardioSource World News are interested in are the ones that investigators will be interested in, the, the p-value. You know, you really want a bright line between when you're approving a drug or a new device, you kind of want a bright line that tells you where the statistics come out. You're kind of taking that bright line. Are you moving it? Are you dimming the line? What are you doing with this? Yeah. So in our minds, there's a difference between there being a bright line at which at some point you have to make a decision and there being a bright line about how much you are learning from a particular piece of evidence. So I realize that at the end of the day, for example, a drug has to be approved or not approved. Most decisions boil down to some sort of dichotomy or trichotomy or whatever, but some decisions have to be made. On the other hand, scientific evidence isn't nice and clean like that. It doesn't just shout at you all the time and say, this is what's right and this is what's true. And so you have you might have a dichotomy of, of a decision that has to be made, but evidence tends to be more continuous. And you have it's stronger evidence or you have weaker evidence. And very rarely do you have the evidence from one experiment or even from just a small number of experiments that totally solves the issue. And, and what we're saying is that you can't pass this off on statistics. You can't just say, okay, here we go. Here's a number that we crunched out of our program. It's a p-value, and it falls beyond this threshold, so we're good to go. Inference is much harder than that. It's much more nuanced than that. It's, it's, um, it involves taking into account everything that we know, and everything that we know doesn't just reduce to one number. And so that's really, the for me, that's the key message of the p-value statement is that we cannot use the p-value as a uh, some sort of threshold marker that tells you, yes, you have learned something, you've reached the conclusion that you needed to reach, or you have not. So what's the world look like in the post p is less than 0 0.05 world? The world looks like a place that embraces all of scientific argumentation, that understands that what goes into an experiment, for example, is um, what we know already about the phenomenon, experiments that have taken place in the past. Now we have a, a particular new experiment with a new group of subjects or uh, some other uh, twist or nuance, 
and we've carefully got some data, and now we have carefully analyzed it using statistics, and all that information is presented and given its fair weight so that the scientific community can evaluate that sum total of that argument and say, okay, what is it that we know a little bit more now than we did before we conducted this study? Because at the end of the day, most science is incremental. Yep, I'm sure a, a historian of science can point out all the, the big leaps here and there in science, but most of the time we learn things by getting a little farther and scratching our heads and saying, what's next? You know, I do editing for Jack now. So one of the things that I've noticed in the last couple of years that I've been doing this is you get a lot of papers and they have the whole statistical section that they, they explain and they come to some very good conclusions with P's well less than 0 0.05. And what they say at the ending is this is just beginning. This is like we're not there yet. And this is what's probably going to lead to something else. So what you're saying is that this is the post, the post P is less than 0 0.05 world in terms of these aren't firm conclusions. This is just one step on the research pathway. So I don't disagree with that at all, but there is a, there's a step missing that we need to fix in the post P less than 0 0.05 world. And that is that that paper or work that you just described got published probably because it had some statistically significant p-values in it. And that paper probably did not con include a detailed discussion of all the other things that were looked at that didn't have a significant p-value. And it probably didn't um, address the other things that might have caused that p-value to be low other than just the fact that the null hypothesis, whatever that might have been in that study, um, uh, was possibly uh, not the case. So in the post P, post P less than 0.05 world, easy for me to say, the, um, th all these things would be taken into consideration in the publication of articles. There'd be no more apologizing for P equal 0.06 as though that's somehow vastly less scientifically revealing than P equals 0.04. There'd be no more need to uh, suffer through what's called the file drawer effect, where the you know, whole bunch of research just never sees the light of day because it didn't come out to be significant. And I hope that there might ultimately be less misunderstanding of what p-values actually do measure because we wouldn't be trying to contort them so much to say what we want them to say, and we would be looking at much more than just p-values when we made arguments. We have a whole lot of other information that's contained in any statistical analysis besides just the p-value. We have effect sizes and other things that are, that are valuable to know and that just sort of have a tendency to get lost if it's just real easy to make the decision by, well, look at this, P wasn't less than 0.05, so we have nothing. Well, I've actually seen papers where it comes out to P equals 0 0.05, and of course, it's not statistically significant. Part of our message is that P equals 0.049 is not qualitatively different in any respect from P equal 0.05, P equal 0.051, whatever, that shouldn't even be a thing anymore. And furthermore, what's usually done is, well, maybe that's not fair. What's tempting to do, okay, when you get P equal 0.05 or P equal 0.051 or something like that, is to play with your analysis a little bit until you get something a little safer. And in a post P less than 0.05 world, that there'd be no reason to do that. Because if P comes out to be 0.08, but you have this massive effect size, you have something to talk about. You don't have anything to excuse anymore. You don't have to try to talk your way out of P equals 0.08. Furthermore, you'd be looking at other ways of measuring the strength of evidence, not just the P value. And so, uh, you would have a whole bunch of things to report and discuss with your colleagues instead of just landing on this one 
number that supposedly arbitrates truth in some way. So here's a, an illustration that somebody gave me recently that I, I think is helpful, at least I hope it will be uh, helpful to, uh, to your audience. So suppose that one were testing in a hypothetical situation 100 null hypotheses that we knew absolutely to be true. OK, they're they're all true. All right. Through some sort of simulation or whatever. We know they're true. So we do a our, our standard statistical test and we use a, a, a P values and we're going to reject all the ones that are um, less than 0 0.05. We're going to we're going to reject those null hypotheses. Well, on average, in that 100 tests, we're going to have five um, uh, tests that show a P value of less than 0 0.05 on average. So we have a 5% error rate in that case, all right? But here's what actually happens, or here's what can easily happen. Those five p-values are the ones that get reported, and none of the other 95 p-values get reported, and then your error rate is 100%. You reported only erroneous results and nothing else. So. That's the sort of thing that we would like people to look for. Did we did we test lots and lots of things right. and just report the significant ones? And why? And and sort of what thought was given to that in the in the paper by the authors? What kind of feedback are you getting? It does it range kind of from are you nuts to thank God people have done something about this and are are starting to talk about it. What, what kind of comments are you getting? I would have to say that even where there has been some disagreement, the general sense of, of the comments that have come back to me directly has been, this is something that needed to be discussed. And so it's, uh, it's being discussed. We, we're getting lots of, lots of email, lots of uh, views of the statement. It's, uh, this morning there was something like 60,000 views of the, of the statement, which I assure you is not the standard for every article that comes out in our journal with the first week. So it's being talked about. And um, we appreciate that um, people in your community and others are talking about it too. And if I could wrap up by saying that the there isn't anybody in the statistical community who thinks somehow that people who are we'll just say doing it wrong with regards to p-values are are doing so because they're incompetent or foolish or whatever the fact of the matter is is that it's it's a tricky concept oh, yeah. it's tricky because essentially it's the reverse of what people are thinking that they're doing, okay? They are, uh, what they're interested in is figuring out the probability that something is true given the data that they have observed. And what the p-value is telling them is what the probability that they would observe the data that they did or something more extreme, assuming that something is true assuming that a null hypothesis and a statistical model are true. And so it's difficult, and inference itself is difficult. It's just hard to learn more and, and, and be able to take what we know and apply it more generally, and it's a slow process. So we encourage everyone to talk to their local statistician and to engage with the, with the ASA and with, with others in their own communities to try to see how we can make the science better as we go into the P less than 0.05 era. I can tell you that my son, who is a statistician and an ASA member, was very pleased that you, you are the first author on this paper and was very pleased to see the ASA do this. So congratulations. Well, thanks. And I, of course, just radically misspoke by saying as we go into the P less than 0.05 era, when I'm eager for us to go into the post P less than 0.05 <laughs> era. Well, We've been in the other era for far too long. <laughs> yes, exactly. I also want to point out that this is a May cover story in CardioSource World News, and there is an editorial coming in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, so look for those. For CardioSource World News, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.